we are doing your other permit, air contaminant discharge permits for water resource recovery and facilities. And we have Chris Mayer and Jamie Hughes from Clean Water Services who are gonna inform us. Take it away. All right, we'll take it away. Thank you, bud. Uh, bud to carry the uh, title slide for us here. And so I think uh, we'll go straight to outline here. Um, and so I'm going to say a few words, I think. Um, you know, we all operate wastewater uh, treatment facilities. These are, you know, pollution control facilities. And I always get upset if anybody ever calls us uh, polluters, right? It's the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System that we work under. And so we do always a great job, right, of cleaning the water and maintaining uh, uh, the health of our receiving streams. Um, but, you know, regardless, I think uh, if you um, have uh, digester gas and you're running gas burning equipment, even if we're just doing activated sludge, um, we are all air polluters. <laughs> we, can, we can say that much, right? We make air pollution, whether we transfer it from the water to the air or not. Um, and so that's kind of where this uh, originated. Um, and so today uh, I'll say this, right? Jamie and I, uh, we're not experts, uh, certainly, and we're here to tell you our experience and what we learned because it's kind of an esoteric thing that not a lot of us know about. Um, so this is just our story. We're going to go through uh, some background on the federal regulation uh, that drives your air contaminant discharge permit, uh, what's actually in your permit, um, and then we are going to go through the uh, experience we've been through renewing a permit at our Rock Creek uh, Water uh, Resource Recovery Facility. Uh, that's operated by Clean Water Services, and that's all we're going to say about Clean Water Services. So, All right, so before we get into going through the ACDP and our permit renewal experience, I'm in the Regulatory Affairs Department. I love regulations, so I wanted to go through all of the federal regulations and how the Clean Air Act came about and whatnot. So before we get into that, let's step back into the 1950s, back when um, the Industrial Revolution was happening and high density development was occurring. Um, cities were experiencing similar to what we're experiencing today outside, a lot of dense visible smog in a lot of these areas. Um, so these are some pictures. This one on the right is actually from the New York Times, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so because of that, as a result, the Clean Air Act um, came into play. So in 1955, the Federal Air Pollution Control Act was enacted by Congress. This was seven years after the Federal Water Pollution Control Act happened in 1948. And I totally geeked out on this and did like a whole night of research on the history of the Clean Air Act, um, which is, I thought was fascinating. And so that was the first major piece of legislation um, in 1963 and 1967 with the Clean Air Act and the Air Quality Act. That was when the actual national program was established. It authorized research into looking at sources, looking at um, control techniques for uh, monitoring techniques for air pollution control. And then in 1970 was actually the Federal Clean Air Act. So that was two years prior to the Federal Water Quality Act or Clean Water Act in 1972. Um, this was the actual like formal program when it was created and it regulated emissions from stationary and mobile sources as well as established four different program areas, four different emissions types um, and I'll go through those in a second. And then in 1977, there was a, an amendment to that where it established permit review requirements because when the Clean Air Act was established in 1970, the goal was to make sure that um, sources could meet emissions standards, the NAAQS emission standards by 1975. They realized by 1977, people were not meeting those NAAQS. So they did a serious amendment and we're putting permit review requirements in to make sure people were looking at their permits and uh, main, maintaining and meeting these NACs. And then in 1990, another serious amendment to the Clean Air Act occurred where they added things like emissions for acid rain and um, ozone layer requirements, things, things like that, that they realized this is occurring now, we should probably um, look at some of these things. It also added um, issuance of technology-based standards for stationary sources. And this is when a lot of the per permit program requirements were developed as well. So here's some fun definitions that I thought were interesting and you probably won't remember, but um, there's two different types of categories of sources under the Clean Air Act. There's what we call a major source and then a uh, area source, which is also called uh, minor sources and, and some other things. 
but a major source is any stationary source or group of stationary sources that emits or has the potential to emit either 100 tons of any air pollutant or 10 tons per year of a hazardous air pollutant or 25 tons per year of a combo of hazardous air pollutants. So basically that's your major source. Um, and then an area source is any stationary source that's not a major source, makes sense. And we fall under the, the minor source category, so area source. There's also um, the NACs that were established with the Clean Air Act. These are national ambient air quality standards. They basically cover six different pollutant categories. And you'll see these pollutants in your air contaminant discharge permit. Uh, PMs or particulate matters, you'll typically see different types, PM10, PM5, PM2.5, depending on the size. You'll see ozone, um, well, I don't, yeah, ozone, SOx, NOx, carbon monoxide, and lead. And then you'll also see a greenhouse gas reporting requirements, probably. We have that in our um, permit. And then these are just some other fun definitions um, for the other categories that were uh, established, the other um, standard categories that were established in the Clean Air Act. Uh, NESAPS is also one of them, the National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants. Hazardous pollutants being things that pose health risks like cancer or environmental risks like bioaccumulation of heavy metals. So there's um, standards for those things as well. And then I just put this slide in here to show what the different types of sources uh, that pollutant emission sources are. There's the stationary sources, which is things like a sewage treatment plant. And I think of this like I think of point sources and non-point sources when you're thinking of your NPDES permit. So stationary sources like your point source and an area source is like your um, non-point source. And then you have your mobile sources as well, um, airplanes, cars, those sorts of things. And then natural sources, just like we're seeing outside the wildfire smoke. So now I just want to show the connection between the Clean Air Act and all the way down to your ACDP and your reports and plans, just so you see how everything's kind of connected. At the top, you have your Clean Air Act, which requires that you have an air contaminant discharge permit. Then it goes to your Code of Federal Regulations and State Administrative Rules, which is where your permit requirements are defined. Um, here I have the OARs cited, the Oregon Administrative Rules, but there are obviously different sets of rules for what state you're in. And then your actual ACDP has all your emissions limits, your monitoring requirements. We'll go through that in a second. And then from there, you submit plans and reports that show that you're meeting these permit requirements. So for example, we have to submit an air discharge annual report every year and source testing reports as well. So air contaminant discharge permits, what is that? Well, these are used to regulate minor sources of air contaminant emissions. They're also used for any new major source or if a, a modification occurs at a major source. Um, in my research on different types of ACDPs, there are a bunch, at least in Oregon. I was looking at our, our DEQ website and there are so many different kinds. And it basically was like, if you, don't, if you don't qualify for a basic ACDP, you might qualify for all these other things. If you don't qualify for those two things, you still might qualify for all these other things. So it's a little bit complicated to figure out what permit you fall under, um, but we landed under a standard ACDP. That's what our uh, treatment plant permit type is. And it all depends on you know, what your industry category is, how much you emit, um, those sorts of things, how long you need the ACDP for. There's short-term ones, short-term activity ones, as well as construction ones. And then there's Title V operating permits for major sources as well. So now I'll just quickly go through what you might see in an ACDP. On the left is the table of contents from our actual uh, permit that's out for, that's uh, being renewed right now for our Rock Creek facility. And then on the right, I just have sort of the general things you might see. You'll have your sources, your equipment sources identified. You'll have general emission standards and limits for things like visible emissions, PMs, uh, particulate matters, fugitive emissions, nuisance odors. You'll have special conditions. So for us, we have these engine generators, which you'll hear a lot about. Um, and we have special conditions for those that are outlined. You also have your O&M requirements, which basically states you have to meet your manufacturer's recommendations typically. Um, your plant site emission limits, uh, compliance demonstration section, which is typically where you'll see your monitoring requirements, um, greenhouse gas uh, requirements, source testing, record keeper report reporting, the typical things you would see in your NPDES permit. And then all the things at the bottom are kind of your boilerplate general conditions, which is what you might see in like Schedule F of your NPDES permit, for example. So this is the typical things you'll see in your permits. And with that, I'll pass it back to Chris to go through our experience at Rock Creek. Okay, the Rock Creek experience. There's the overview of the plant and we're gonna dive in 
uh, here to our digester gas uh, utilization system. Uh, so just give you guys the background. So you got a picture of what's going on here. Um, five anaerobic digesters, okay? And gas utilization uh, is through two engine generators circa 1990. Um, there's a couple of Clean Water Act era boilers installed there in the 70s. Um, more boilers added in the 90s. That was a big growth phase in Washington County. Um, flares now upgraded over the years. So that's what we do with the gas. Um, in 2021, uh, we generated 161 MMCF. Is it million, million? No. All right. MMCF, those are Roman numerals. I don't know why we have to go there with air, air stuff, right? So that's a thousand thousand CFF, uh, CF, right? Uh, CFS, a thousand thousand cubic feet of gas. So we say that's a million cubic feet of gas, right? Okay, too much detail. Power, uh, 2021 power generation at the plant, uh, 4,500 megawatt hours we made for the year. So there's the system. Um, so let's start this uh, permit history. The ACDP that we're currently under was issued in 2008 and expired, uh, expired in 2013, right? And so it's been administratively extended, right? Uh, since 2013 in quotes, because uh, I'm not sure how much administration went into it. We're not asked to sub uh, submit a renewal. Um, we're not asked anything. We just go along. We keep mailing in the annual uh, ACDP report. Um, keep running our engines. And so uh, life is good, right? Permit requirements, monitoring, record keeping, reporting, uh, our plant site emissions by these emission factors, standard emission factors, and the engines that we're running are unclassified, right? So no limits on uh, emissions from these engines, no restrictions, uh, not even maintenance requirements in that original permit. Um, okay, so uh, there we are, and we're just living the blissful life of cogen. Um, but, right, you guys know as well as I do what sometimes causes bliss for you, right, it's ignorance. So that's where we were standing with our permit. Um, I'm going to dive into like these engine generators so uh, we all understand um, that we weren't doing nothing. Uh, the original uh, pollution control equipment was catalytic converters on these. Uh, however, right, the, ca uh, the cats kept fouling and clogging because there's no gas cleaning system, digester gas is dirty. Um, so in 2008, uh, prior to that permit issue, we pulled out the catalytic converters and we went with something called a uh, pre-stratified charge emission control. Um, and so I struggled forever to understand this. And sometimes, I don't know about you guys, I get stuck on like, if I can't understand what that is, I'm out of business. Uh, the stratification occurs in the combustion chamber, okay? So I have my spark plug um, and I have my gas fuel mixture, and then I have uh, the stratified charge putting air in uh, further down the cylinder, right? So that's the stratification. At the point of ignition, uh, it's, it's a rich mixture, right? More gas, uh, more fuel to air. Uh, I put more in later, and so it uh, stratifies that charge. And so I get a more uh, efficient or more complete combustion out of that. Uh, this is what it looks like. I have a, a simple air intake and a control valve. Um, and then that air is drawn into each uh, uh, cylinder behind, somewhere behind uh, the spark plug. Okay, so that's what the stratified charge does. This uh, manufacturer of this uh, system was quickly out of business after we put it in. Uh, the technology uh, was, you know, a questionable history in the industry, and um, maybe, maybe not the uh, questionable history as a process and a piece of equipment at Rock Creek, as in, we're not quite sure, like, was it running, was it optimized, what, what were we actually doing with this thing? So, uh, in 2019, Engine 2 had a failure, all right? So this is the kind of stuff I have to understand too. Uh, so you're looking at the diagram here. I'm gonna go up here, right? If the bolts that hold this connecting rod between the piston and the crankshaft, if those break off, then the loose rod now bangs around in your block with explosive force because it's still firing and that thing is beating around until it comes through the block 
And that's what we see in the pictures over here, right? It bangs around till it beats a hole through the uh, cast, whatever that the, is the block of your engine. And then your engine's done for, okay? So complete failure of engine two in 2019. Uh, so what's our options gonna be, right? One option, we just abandon this thing and flare the gas, right? We say it's an old engine. Uh, we don't quite know what's going on um, with the program. We're just gonna flare the excess gas. Uh, second option, right? Wait, wait for the uh, RNG project uh, to, to be installed, okay? And this complicated uh, all our decisions that we made, right? Because RNG project is in the works and it's only two, two to three years out, right? And RNG is two to three years out for the last 10 years, 10 years, two to three years out, any day now, right? So we're trying to like put this into our planning horizon of what we're gonna do here. Uh, we could replace the engine and by replace, I mean like buy a brand new state-of-the-art uh, engine and put in there, or we could reconstruct this engine. And so we chose reconstruction, right? So we found the same engine, right? Same make, model, uh, manufacturer, the only thing was a different serial number, but it was out with the old engine, right? The whole block, the valves, the heads, everything. Out with the old, in with the new. This was a, a refurbished engine uh, from like salvaged parts from Sinor engine over the years. So that's the option we, we went with. Uh, we're back to permit stuff. And so I'm gonna turn it back to Gene. So now that you sort of understand where we were at with the engines, um, you can kind of understand that situation. But um, in October, 2020, DEQ finally reached out and was like, hey, we're just gonna start drafting your new permit now for your Rock Creek facility. And we have some simple requests for information, things on you know, what, what source equipment do you have? What's your production? Um, so we're attempting to gather that information, but at the same time, our NPDES permit renewal application was due in December of that same year. So the regulatory affairs staff, myself and others, were very busy with that. So it was hard to focus on this permit renewal um, requests from DEQ. Also at the same time, uh, Roger Diltz, love you Roger, he uh, retired at the end of December and so we lost his knowledge. He basically was the one doing all of the air quality stuff in our department. Hands that all to me and good luck Jamie, figure it out. <laughs> so it took us a little while to get this information together back to DEQ by uh, November 2020. Um, so we're already off to a little bit of a rocky start there with DEQ. All right, so uh, a little back and forth with DEQ, uh, right? Some more uh, information requests, like what kind of, what, what is this engine? How do you operate it? Um, things like this. Uh, but in February, we get the first draft back to us uh, of the permit. Um, and in this draft permit, the engines are now classified. Okay, so uh, we see the table here, right? Durham, Durham, our other facility, the other big plant, right? It has two nice new Yenbacher, right? State-of-the-art engines with gas cleaning system and everything. And you can see those are subpart JJJJ, okay? Engine generator one at Rock Creek is under subpart ZZZZ. Say, well, I'm not familiar with that, but we take a look at the requirements and they're telling me uh, uh, over at Durham, you have to meet 610 ppm of carbon monoxide, but this engine has to meet 23 parts of CO. Okay, so uh, I don't know. Uh, EG2 um, comes in under subpart III. I said, well, what, what is that? Uh, and right, this, this one, I did the calculations over here. This one, for whatever reason, gives us limits in grams per kilowatt per hour. And so we say, well, now I can't compare these, but we figure out the math and I take this back over here and I say, would this thing has to meet 2.6, like grams per horse, that's less than 5.3 on NOx compared to two. Okay, so a um, bunch of questions, but the real question that we kind of asked each other and asked ourselves and that you might be asking is that if there's a subpart JJJJ, is there a JJJ and JJJ too? Okay, so with, right, we don't understand these regulations. So you go through here and, and you try and find it and you click on this link and we're gonna take just a second because this is fun. But we, we don't have, we have to yeah. Okay, there we go. All right, so you click on this link and you come up here. Oh, here it is, Code of Federal Regulations and I subpart A, B, C, D, E, F, G, J. Oh, there goes J. I saw J. There's no JJ, I'll tell you that. There is JJJ. 
Oh, we got to go back up and and the other thing is, oh yeah, see, there's I, 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 and subpart J, 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 and we can click on that and say, great, now we can figure this all out, right? And we start scrolling through here, right? You see the, you guys see the thing? This thing is like a thousand pages of regulations that I have no idea or like no experience with. So how are we gonna figure this out? Um, you'll know, right? And uh, you would notice, uh, we don't need to, we can X out of here. Uh, the point has been made, um, J, 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 J. Uh, you notice uh, there was no Z, 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 Z in that document because subpart Z, 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 Z is not under part 60, it's under uh, part 63, subpart Z, 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 right? So we have to go and find that, All right? Thank you, point made, right? Some complex, <laughs> like not very well understood by us regulations. Okay, uh, what's next? Comments back on the first draft, which is uh, definitely Jamie's department. Yeah, so when you get your first draft of your permit, you have to go through it really carefully, line by line, and make sure you can meet everything in it, make sure that it makes sense, that it's clear. And then you put a comment letter together and you send that back to DEQ and hope to God they take all the changes that you asked for. Um, so we got our, our comments, or we got our permit, we looked through it. Um, and basically there were a couple of things we wanted clarification on. There were a couple of like inconsistent references and things like that. But the main thing we wanted to ask was, how the heck did you classify these engines? What was your reasoning behind it? And can we actually reclassify them all to be under subpart JJJJ? Because both of these engines are spark ignition rices, which means they should fall under this JJJJ, right? Not sure, question mark. So we were asking them this, uh, and that's where we landed. Um, yeah, and so the answer back uh, was, no on engine generator one, that's uh, ZZZZ. Uh, you wanna do this now? Uh, no, you, uh, okay. We'll be done with the ZZZ, right? It's all fun, right? Z4 and J4 from now on, okay? Okay. Uh, engine G EG1 stays as Z4. It's like, um, okay, that's gonna be a problem. Uh, engine uh, two, uh, subpart J4. So reclassed from I4 to J4. Right, so we have the same limits as, as Durham. We say, well, oops, that's a win, I guess. Um, all right, so at this point now, we're like, well, if these are gonna be the limits, we better ask the question, can we even meet any of these limits? Um, and so, you know, what I find is that in 2008, we did some source testing on these engines and I have the draft report and it gives me the CO and the NOx, um, but it gives me PPMV, but not at 15% O2, which is what's in the permit. Um, and it gives me some other uh, kind of flow rates and exhaust gas and some kilowatts. Um, and so, you know, we're water people, right? We'll do N minus out over N times 100 all day long, MCRT, SRT, F to M, anything you want, right? This was a new world for me uh, in these like air calculations. But we look at it uh, the same as a wastewater process, right? I got a flow rate of some things at certain concentrations coming into a process. There's a transformation of those things and I have a flow rate and a concentration of different things coming out of the process, okay? Uh, so uh, the calculations, I'm gonna go through the calculations in only half excruciating detail and you're welcome for that, but I put them in here because we all get proceedings and uh, maybe it'll be a useful reference for somebody someday. Uh, so we have to uh, adjust these readings to 15% O2. How do you do that? Uh, you come up with this factor, air is 21% oxygen. So I say 21 minus my reference, which is 15 divided by 21 minus my test condition. And I'll come up with this factor here of 0.4, right, for the source test. So I take these uh, numbers from the source test. I had 500 ppm VCO uh, and some NOx, and those become 196 and 294, respectively, at 15% O2. I say, well, great, I did the math, but 196 ppm VCO is definitely not 23, right? So not gonna not gonna convert, not gonna meet. Um, the other thing we have to do, right, is this calcs PPMV to this gram per horsepower or kilowatt hour that, that they're uh, putting in the permit. Um, so uh, this is the pounds equation for air. I have a flow rate of air, SCFM. I have a concentration, PPM, 
um, and I have a density and that density now is the density of carbon monoxide or the density of NOx um, typically at standard conditions. Okay, so pounds equation for air contaminants. Uh, I go through the standard conversions to get gram per hour. I had the horsepower and kilowatts divide and convert between those. And we come out, uh, for instance, on this NOx now, 294 ppm NOx, right, at the test conditions. Uh, you can see the math work out. That comes down to 3.3 gram per horsepower per hour. Definitely not the two that's in the permit. Um, so we might go ahead and we're going to go back and forget about that. Um, right. So we do these calculations and Jamie and I kind of uh, talk and look at each other and say, does this mean what I think it means? Does this mean like this might mean complete obsolescence of the cogeneration system at Rock Creek, right? We got engines and a permit uh, that if we sign it, we're not gonna be able to meet. Um, it was also at this time, as we tell the story, that Jamie and I looked at each other and said, basically, do you have any idea what you're doing here? Right? And uh, the answer back and forth between us was no, right? So it was time to call in some help. Yeah, so we definitely assembled a team and we called in people from the outside as well. We had a regulatory group, obviously myself and my boss, Bob. Our O&M department would help us with the maintenance and we meet the limits and doing any testing that needed to be done. Our engineering group, Chris and others to do the math because I don't do that. And then um, as we mentioned, Roger leaving, we had other staff that were leaving. So we had that loss of institutional knowledge at the same time. So we called in the Toms. So Tom Mossinger from Carollo helped us with the technical expertise behind um, source testing and maintenance requirements. And then Tom Wood, we called in from Stoll Reeves to help us with the legal and regulations expertise because he knew all of those subparts and knew all the, the, the minutia in the, in the regulations that we did not know. Um, so we set out some tasks for O&M and engineering. What can we meet? Can we meet these limits? How do we manage our emissions? And under the regulatory side of things, we wanted to understand those classifications for those engines and the limits that are in there, and then be able to negotiate those with the EQ, whether or not we wanted those to be changed. All right, so uh, I'm taking o and in engineering. And so what we did on that front was uh, some in-house source testing, um, some maintenance on these engines. We tried to tune them up, um, more source testing. Uh, here again, right? Um, lost institutional institutional knowledge. That is a tough one. Uh, so, right. Thank you to Eric Sandstrom. Right, he was the plant maintenance technician on these engines for like most of his career, and he owned those engines. And beyond that, uh, he loved those engines. And certainly, other technicians rotated through, um, but he was the go-to guy and knew those engines inside and out don't have that anymore, right? So we got to relearn some stuff. Anyway, uh, we get the old Ecom B combustion analyzer, right? And we put that thing to work. Uh, and the guys do some source testing on this thing. And they send me the results. Uh, just like this. Here's a picture of the screen of results for you, Chris. I said, uh, okay, uh, let's see what this is. Um, carbon uh, CO and NOx, right? At 15% O2. Great. But what what is this milligrams per cubic meter? Why you got to throw that at me now? Okay. And a bunch of other data there. I say, well, let's go back to the drawing board for this calculation. Um, how are we going to uh, get that into PPMV? So I'm going to turn a mass of gas into a volume of gas. It sounded to me like the ideal gas law. Um, I said the ideal gas law always has moles in it. So I probably need a molecular weight in the equation somewhere. Uh, and so sure enough, that's the uh, conversion you have to do here. Um, I've taken my uh, ideal gas constant in mil millimeters of mercury, I guess, just to make it fun. Um, the temperature is the temperature of that exhaust gas. The pressure is the uh, atmospheric pressure minus the draft in that. So that's like actual conditions you have to apply to those results. Uh, you go through and you do the math, right? Cancel your units and you're left with milliliters per cubic meter. Uh, and just to prove it to myself, I did the rest of the math, and sure enough, that means a milliliter per one thousand or one million milliliters. Uh, so we're in ppmv now. Um, so now that we can do all the math, we can make graphs, uh, right? And we do some more in-house source tests and a bunch more testing. Uh, we draw the permit lines on there, 
and we say if we're going on a gram, um, you know, gram per horsepower per hour, maybe we can meet the CO requirement. Um, we're not going to meet PPM, uh, but in no condition anywhere are we going to meet this NOx requirement. Uh, so back to regulations, what can we do with the classifications of these engines? Was Jamie's job? Yeah, Jamie plus Tom Wood from the legal group because he knew what he was doing and he dug through the subparts. And basically he determined that the classification for engine generator one, which we had asked the EQ to change to subpart J4, um, they actually, or they, they changed it. Yeah, they changed it from subpart. We were asked them to change it to J4, but they, the Z, 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 Z was actually correct because, um, because of the install date was before 2006. So the install date determined whether or not it, it qualified to be under subpart ZZZZ. Um, additionally, there were limits that Chris mentioned, the 23 ppm VD um, was also for a compression ignition engine. And our engine was actually a spark ignition engine. So that, that table on the right is where the 23 ppm VD is for this compression ignition engine. Because it doesn't apply, because it's not a compression ignition engine, it should actually be under this uh, table D13. And also more importantly, it burns entirely on digester gas. So it should only be maintenance requirements that, it, um, that apply. So no CO limit should apply because it burns on digester gas and because it's a spark ignition engine. So it's correctly categorized under subpart ZZZ, but it should only be maintenance requirements. So it gets really complicated, which is why we had Tom do it. <laughs> And then um, the other issue was for EG2, because we had reconstructed it, we had to determine was it pre-2006 or post-2006 to be under JJJJ or ZZZZ? And was it really a reconstructed engine because we only reconstructed pieces of it? Um, additionally, if the cost of the reconstruction was greater than 50% of the cost of a comparable new engine, um, same thing, which category would it apply under? So. Digging through all of that, we basically determined that it's obviously really difficult to find a comparable new engine and that, yes, it was going to be greater than the cost, the 50% cost of the new engine. So EG2 was installed in 2019 after this 2005 date, and therefore it was correctly classified under subpart JJJJ. So the EQ did correctly classify both engines. So it's a good thing we called in the experts to go through these. Um, additionally, there's another like little nuance to this is depending on the manufacturer and install date, there's two different sets of limits that could apply um, to the NOx uh, standard. And NOx was the thing that we were not sure we were going to be able to meet. So depending on the install date, um, you would either be under this three grams per horsepower hour or this two grams per horsepower hour. And because we looked at the install date of our uh, engine block, it was actually pre-2007, 2008, Therefore, therefore, we get a little bit more room on our NOx requirement and we're under that three grams per horsepower hour limit. So we did ask DEQ to adjust uh, the permit for that as well. Okay, so then in the latest draft of our permit, this is, uh, this is where we are right now. Um, subpart Z4, maintenance requirements only on EG1, right? The one that didn't uh, uh, blow itself up. Uh, EG2, newly reconstructed, subpart J4. Uh, we have these gram per horsepower hour uh, limits you see here. We got the relief on the NOx. Um, and uh, I hate to say this, Jamie, but uh, as I was looking through the draft permit, that uh, I noticed that um, this 150 here should probably be 220 because that's how it was in the, uh, in the table. Uh, 150 is for two, two more stories, yeah. No, uh, I did. I swear to God, I found that in, in my review, just going through here, right? That's permit review. Uh, and I told Jamie ahead of time because she would have said bad words in front of you here. Um, all right. So uh, where does that leave us? Uh, and then we'll have discussion. Uh, look, that, that leaves us at this point, right? Uh, where am I at? Uh, on the left here, right? I have EG1 a 30 year old engine uh, that I can run as long as I want with no limits, maintenance only requirements, as long as I never spend more than 50% uh, of the cost of a comparable new engine on that maintenance, I guess. Um, I have EG2 uh, over on the right, um, uh, newly reconstructed engine, 
same make, same model, same manufacturer, different serial number that I cannot run and meet the limits and will either have to be shut down or have some kind of emission control system put on it. So that's the insanity of ACDP at Rock Creek. Um, I think that's it. And we're gonna take questions and discussion. And we are still waiting for our permit to be issued. <laughs> and still no permit. Still no permit. And uh, we're all also taking odds on whether we're going to sign that MPDS permit uh, that we submitted the application for or the air permit first. And most of the money's on that we'll actually get a watershed based NPDS permit in place before an air quality permit. Thank you. Um, but has, but has, of course. Hello. Hello. This is more of a story. I was in California and they were having the rolling blackouts. And so uh, during the rolling blackouts, what they would do is they would just shut down part of their processes. They turn off the, the blowers, they turn off the clarifiers, the solids would just go right on through their system. And I looked over and they, they said, yeah, we have a rolling blackout. We have to shut down part of our system. And I looked over on the side and they said, well, what about your generators? Why don't you just run those? They don't meet permit. We can't run the generators. So, so they were just pay, putting wastewater out without full treatment because of you know regulations. It's like, oh my gosh. My life. I like I like that's more insane than what we got yeah, going on. Thank you. That I did air quality for like fourteen years, so that was my life. For God. I'm I'm past those equations and on to different ones now. Uh, and I, I maybe know the answer to this, but to pose it, if that engine doesn't run and you're flaring the gas, are your emissions now higher or lower? And have you looked at that? Um, Not that it necessarily matters for you here, but yeah, um, um, we like we have. I haven't looked at like the uh, what the emissions would be. Um, certainly, right. The, all subject to emission factors and, and flares, but right. That's the easiest thing you can do is just flare your gas. There's no. And you may just have higher emissions if you're doing that when kind yeah. of same thing, you don't get the energy. You don't and get the energy. you have higher emissions to go with it. Mm -hmm. There's still the same amount of carbon, right? Going up the atmosphere. So it sounded like your emissions limits were based on the engine type and combustion type. Um, is there any, do you know if there's any alternative that you could look at for like a impact, environmental impact to determine emissions limits? Um, let me understand the question. Any, any alternative like analysis you could do? Yeah. To, like, or, so or, in, okay. in like an NPDS permit, you'd have like a receiving water study or, um, impact, but would there be anything like that for a air quality analysis? I don't know. You have any idea? I don't know. I'll, I'll say this, like the one thing we came across uh, when we were up against 23 PPM CO, uh, the alternative in, in the uh, regulation was to reduce your CO emissions by 70%. So I don't know if that exists in the, uh, the subpart J4 regulations that you might have some equivalent or alternate way to meet your limits. I would think that that Tom would have maybe brought that up if that was something we could do. But, yeah. Can you speak a bit about your education to management above and to like the maintenance crews who you're working with? Because you were learning this on the fly and being, you know, struggling with the air rules. Uh, I live this every day at my facilities. How did you successfully message this? Because it's a new culture. It's a new way of thinking to management and also to maintenance so that they cared. I mean, we were definitely in meetings with all of them all the time, and they were super interested in this because of that transition to the renewable natural gas project as well. So they were definitely wanting to hear, can we, what do we need to do with these engines? Can we meet the limits? Um, yeah, you know, like lots of meetings. <laughs> yeah, and and right, the, the team together, right? Chad is the maintenance supervisor. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin uh, is in charge of all anaerobic digestion, so he has an interest in there. Um, and so it was, it was mostly that, um, but, uh, 
also like for us or right yeah like you came and saw equipment and tour and the source testing right i would go down there and pat or uh, was very hands-on and so you're kind of uh, down there while they're doing the source testing and you're not hands-on but you're there uh, explaining um, what we're after here um, and i will say yeah uh, right i got the email from the deq uh, permit uh, coordinator because i handled the previous inspection um, right and so it came only to me and so immediately i said hey right plant supervisor ops division manager hey i got this request regulatory right jamie and bob this request came through uh, do you guys have any concerns about re renewal of this permit because of this RNG project and things like that? So initial kind of initial like uh, transparency and communication, but, hey, which is which I guess is basically to say like call in the help when you need help, right? I wasn't going to handle it. So so you guys mentioned a few times uh, it was classified JJJJ because it was the cost was fifty percent greater than a comparable engine off the top of your head if we bought a beater engine that was under 50 percent, would that get us out of it anyhow and then fix it up wasn't it i think yeah if it was less than 50 percent of the cost of a new engine then that was not a reconstructed a new reconstructed engine you just did a little bit of maintenance on it uh and it's a, still like the original um pre-2006 and it would have been Z, z4 and maintenance requirements only. Do you guys keep the receipt? <laughs> <laughs> it was not easy to figure out. There was right. We came and said, uh, we tried like, here's the parts, and Tom came back and said, yeah, what's the labor? We said, what labor? You guys put labor in there, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, labor included. So that pushed it up there too. Vasily, I don't know what the what the other like answer would have been. Uh, time's up, um, right? You have uh, that engine; it's done for. Uh, you can't necessarily replace that uh, for less than fifty percent. I guess I'd say maybe we would have gone with like a, a brand new, nice engine that uh, we could have got certified and met those requirements. Might have been the decision had we known we'd be subject to this at the time. Thanks. Thank you, guys.